Well, I will start by asking a favor. I have been living in Buenos Aires since 22 years ago. People in Buenos Aires speak very, very fast. I live in Buenos Aires. And I speak very fast in Spanish, in English, and any language, independently of whether I know the language or not. So, uh, so and the, the second question, my presentation will start with Morgan, because you will find many, many similarities between what Morgan said and what I'm going to say. Uh, we did not coordinate. And my presentation was finished early this morning. So you will make your conclusion. Or if there was any copy, it's your point. So, uh, and my presentation has a lot to do with what Morgan said about sadness and nostalgia. Uh, I will, my presentation has two parts. The first part is about data. And the second part is about meaning. Uh, while, and I will try to use, I'm not of Andean origin in my blood, but maybe in other time. But I, I have devoted a lot of time and thinking just to try to understand the way people think in the Andes and understand in the Andes. And, uh, and in the Andes, thing is based on dualism. Uh, and I have some tools here. One of the tools is this book. This is a book that collects traditional folk stories from South Peru, from the late 19th century. They come from oral tradition in Quichua, the local language in that area, and were translated into Spanish. In my presentation, I will show you a very short tale, but most of my presentation will be in English. It was conceived in English <laughs> from the beginning. Uh, the, the parts from this book are going to be in Spanish because it was already translated from Quichua to Spanish, so some of the meaning is lost. If we go from Quichua to Spanish to English, maybe we are going to do a mess. So any of you who is interested in understanding, look for a dictionary, it's not so hard, and try to translate it. And I will show you also the title of an article in French, and I decided not to translate because the meaning is in French. And speaking about uh, one of my teachers to understand the Andean world, well, first is experience, but not only experience. There's a lady, she's an Argentinian born from the German family, German. She is an anthropologist, and she's called Barbara Gebel. Barbara is now in Berlin. She's the director of the Latin American Institute in Berlin. And as several of us here, she's a mad person in the good and bad sense of the word. And uh, she has an article. I have the article here in my uh, computer. Pablo knows this article. Uh, it's an article about risk, about different perceptions and perspectives of risk. She spent several years living with the people who are herders in the mountains in the province of Jujuy, Argentina. And uh, she came from Germany, got off of the bus, took her bike, and rode 30 kilometers and spent one, two, three, four months in, the, in that village. And I went to that village. And when I told the people about her, said, yeah, Barbara, of course. So Barbara meant a lot to that people. The one of the articles about risk by Barbara, Pablo knows the article, uh, compares the perspectives of the veterinaries coming from universities, from Buenos Aires where I work, from different places, and of the local people about disease. And what is understood for disease, about the cause of disease, and about how to find a solution to the disease, is extremely different 
from the Western perspective and from the local perspective. It doesn't mean that co communication is not possible. It means that communication is necessary. And uh, one other point, uh, I wrote it here. Uh, I, I, I am personally, and I understand many of us, uh, for the quality of the communication and discussion we had at this meeting. And my hypothesis is, I will read it, that we were able to get along together because we all share the love of a single lady. And the single lady is not jealous. Not us, the single lady who all has love is not sick. Okay, uh, I'm going, I'm sorry for the time in taking, but I need this time. I will go to nostalgia. I read this place one day before. So I had the whole Sunday to uh, go around. And on the afternoon of Sunday, I went from here to Palouse Falls. And my plan was to stop anytime, any place I wanted, because I wanted to have that time for me. Uh, I grew up in a farm in the northern area of the Pampas in Argentina. The Pampas is where most uh, food is produced in Argentina. So the, the corn, the Argentinian corn belt is 500 kilometers to the south of where I grew up. Uh, but my family decided to go up north. So uh, I grew up in a place in Argentina where Europe finished and Latin America begins. But that's subject of another conversation. So, but the point is that I grew up in a farm. Uh, many of my neighbors were of Italian origin. And they spoke Spanish. They didn't speak Italian because many of them, they didn't speak Italian. They spoke the local dialects. My family spoke Novares, that is a variant of Piemontese, that is a language that's more connected to French than to Italian. Uh, when I was around 12 years old, we moved to the city. The city is a small town, now 20,000 people. Uh, most people in Argentina moved to the cities. And most people sold their land. My neighbors had small farms for Argentinian standards. That means a family was able to live with 100 hectares. That's around 200 acres. Now, it is not possible in that part to have an economic sustainable farm with less than 500 hectares. That means 1,000 acres. That means that we lost our traditions together with our farms. My family was able just to keep because we are just in the line. And so I, I stopped in several places. One of the places is a small town called Dusty. Fascinating. In Spanish, we don't have a town called Polvoriento. Yeah? So uh, and about this disc. And there's a song from this disc that is not after my presentation. The song is the final part of the presentation. And I bought these two. My father doesn't speak English. But when I showed this to him, it was very clear what this is for. This is made of iron, it's a recycled iron, and it's used to clean the hoof of the horses. So I came here and I went out on Sunday to look for the culture we lost in my country. Well, uh, let's go to the second part. Okay, so I will speak first about data. And for those of you who like data and only data, after the end of my first part, you can leave. Uh, okay, so what's the situation? Uh, many people, not only out of Argentina, but also in Argentina, think that in Argentina, we don't have traditional cultivation of quinoa. Uh, if many people tell me, there's no quinoa in Argentina. Is that Quinoa is brought from Bolivia. It's not, that's not local quinoa. I would try to demonstrate that's not true. So uh, there were little, little, little knowledge about, of course, genetic variability, genetic structure, etc. until 2006, when we began for the first time a systematic collection of germplasm. And 
uh, we started just trying to recover accession that went in plus bank in Peru, Bolivia, the United States. So I have to thank all the people who gave seen on me. And we went doing collecting. So this is where Northwest Argentina is. Uh, this is the province of Jujuy. This is the province of Salta. Here's Catamarca. Province are our states. And this is Chile, and this is Bolivia. You see, oh, well, you have Paraguay here. And it shows and gives an idea of the distribution of quinoa. I'm not going to speak uh, about environment cell because it's not the subject of the presentation today. So uh, there was a student by Sabina Costa Tartara. She did the molecular work and she used 35 sections. And the, the, we have 19 sections from this area. So she took around one cell, but it covered the whole range of distribution. And so part of Sabina's thesis is already published. So there's an article by Sabrina last year, I don't remember what's concentration genetics or microcell, another paper. And so uh, she did molecular studies, she used microsatellites, she uh, took 22 microsatellites, and she took data plant by plant. And she got this result. She identified four genetic groups. Uh, this is already published, this is already in several congresses. So uh, basically, uh, she found one group from dry valleys, that means valleys between 3,000 meters, 2,500. Uh, other from the highlands, so this was called the Altiplano or the Puna, similar to where quinoa is grown in, in Bolivia. Uh, we have an eastern humid valley. Those valleys are to the east. It rains a lot, around 1,000 millimeters, conditions much better for maize. This is an area where maize is the most important crop, very similar to some of the situation you saw on Malawi. I will have a transition shot. I will, I will tell you about this later. So uh, the second part of his thesis was trying to understand how did that germplasm reach the place. And so the, there was an objective of his thesis as to start a relationship between origin and to evaluate alternative hypotheses. Well, here is only one of the hypotheses because it's the one that we believe is the more closest to reality, but there was an alternative hypothesis was the initial one. We thought that maybe one population came from somewhere, could have come from Bolivia or from, from Chile, and that population diversified and adapted to different environments. Uh, the second hypothesis was that quinoa arrived pre-packaged from the several types of environment to those environments in Argentina. And we have strong, strong evidence in favor of this last hypothesis. So, uh, we did what we could, and we could get so far from several sources, 22 accessions from Bolivia, 10 from Chile, one from Colombia, two from Ecuador, and eight from Peru. And those were two molecular characterizations. And here you have the origin of those populations. So uh, you have one from Nariño, this is a, the, the, the one with the northern origin, and it's, a pro, it's in the province of Pasto in Colombia. We have several from Ecuador, several from Peru, some from the valleys, some from the highlands, and several from Bolivia, also from central Chile, and also from Bolivia. Here you have, oh, well, here the name of the, the different provinces and places. Uh, this is part of uh, Sabrina's resource. She did this one. The, the guys from BYU know that you have several techniques when you analyze the gene expression. Well, you have a light that turns on and another light that turns off. And Sabrina did the same. Uh, she took several of these microsatellite markers and compare, uh, I will tell you later, five genetic groups, I will show the groups later, uh, and for different uh, molecular weights. And uh, she did find that there are some of the loci that are very good to differentiate between genetic groups. And the most important question here is that group five is quinoa coming from southern Chile. And the other groups are from the Andes, and all these groups are in Northwest Argentina. And maybe you remember from faculty that you have different approaches to data when you are doing taxonomy. So in taxonomy, you have the people who does phoneticism and people who does cladism. Usually, when we use a microsatellite data, we are 
the, doing phoneticism. That means that we are doing comparisons, but those comparisons do not allow us to do or to reach phylogenetic conclusions. Because to, to reach phylogenetic conclusion, you have to use cladism. And in cladism, there's a notion of, I would say it in Spanish, heterobadmias. I think English is heterobadmias or something like that. That means uh, that you have two groups in which you have one trait that is in one group and is not in the other group, and another trait that is in one group and is not in the other group. So, and you have here several examples of that, this and this, this and this. So that means that with this kind of data and data that Rick Jevin, who's there, who's there has the published an article in genome several years ago, analyzing variation at the nucleotide level. And they compare how many four cultivars, two from southern Chile and two from the Andes? Please correct me. It's for you, the question. <laughs> okay, I understand the word for. And uh, the, the, what's fascinating there, and I did show that in, 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 in a talk I gave six years ago in Chile, is that uh, the variety from the Andes had one combination of nucleotides, and those from Chile had another combination, but they had a small uh, variation because they had only four cultivars. Here, this comparison includes 90 different. Uh, varieties from the whole of the Andes in which you can see that you can differentiate. So Rick and me, we are strongly convinced that there was a, in, an independent domestication event in Chile. Uh, well, we come back to that later. Well, another question that's <clears throat> very, very nice for us, at this part, and sorry, it's in Spanish, uh, is that when we did this comparison between the amount of variability we have and the variability we could detect in the area, we found that of the whole variability, 53% of that variability is shared with the other regions in the Andes. And we found that uh, uh, let's see, this 35% is only outside of Northwest Argentina. But this includes also Chile. If I remove Chile, the amount of proportion that is in the Northwest of Argentina is much bigger. And 12% of that variability is only in the Northwest of Argentina. That means that we have around two thirds of the amount of variability we were able to detect in this work. Well, uh, these are the results yeah, you don't like cluster this way, so I just will go a little bit further. Uh, we detected five genetic groups, and some of those groups are extremely fascinating, and I'm not going to tell you because it will take me a lot of time, because some groups, for example, where is it? This one is a group that combines quinoa from the border between the Salta province and the and Lake Titicaca. And it means that quinoa is letting us make hypotheses about historical events. And when I told this to a lady who's an archaeologist and knows a lot of the area, she said, of course, the India, the, uh, the Incas took people from Lake Titicaca to that area to explore gold and silver mine. But we'll stop there. So uh, we have one group from the Dry Valleys in Northwest Argentina, and that group extends to Sucre and Tarija, the Dry Valleys in Bolivia. We have a second group that includes the highlands from Northwest Argentina, plus the South Bolivia highlands, that means Quinoa Real, and the north of Chile. What does this mean? That Quinoa Real is a kind of subgroup of a bigger group. We have materials, varieties, that are from a phenotypic point of view, quinoa real. But from a genotypic point of view, they are genetically different. So it is not that one person took quinoa real from uh, Bolivia to that part of Argentina. That quinoa real was there since a long, long time. And we are doing research in archaeological seeds. And we are studying seeds from this area more than 600 years old. And they are very similar to quinoa real. Uh, 
Then we have the transition. We have the oriental humid valleys from northwest Argentina, where maize is grown. They are very connected with Tarija, very connected, and with varieties from central Peru and Colombia. And I will come back to this group later. And we have the final group, the most differentiated one, the one from sea level in Chile. And what I said is the most, and that is strongly consistent. We always see the same. Always see that the Chilean germ plasma is differentiated from the Andean germ plasma. Okay, so um, these are the hypothetical relationships. Rick corrects me. So uh, I understand that there is a common ancestor, common canopoemus sino of some populations that. Uh, what, some population gave origin to the material from southern Chile, the sea level, the material is cultivated in Mediterranean environments because most of the quinoa that's grown out of the Andes come from southern Chile. And this day you show a lot of examples of quinoa being cultivated in Mediterranean environments. So there's, that means that we have to go to Chile <laughs> and be with it. People in Chile and learn a lot of how they cultivate and then we have two groups. I, I, I decided to call one the dry quinoas, and I would call this the Aymara quinoas. And we have the cumul quinoas. The dry quinoas have a, a, a small range of distribution. You find them in Chile, Bolivia, and Northwest Argentina. And the cumul ones have a much, much broader extension. So they are in Northwest Argentina, in Bolivia, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. That means around how many kilometers? 4,000 kilometers. This is very, very long range. So that's data. Stop talking about data. Now let's go to speak about meaning. So I told you what does this means to me. Uh, what is this for you? What is this? OK, this is for you. For me, this is Edamame. Edamame is the main character of the last novel by Aruke Murakami. You know Murakami, the Japanese writer? You should. OK. Uh, well, let's go back to me. Uh, uh, I have a hypothesis. My idea was to tell this in the Congress of Anthropology. I don't know where. Uh, then I was invited to a meeting next year of the International Society of Ethnobiology in Bhutan. That's wonderful. I'm going to Bhutan. So, uh, but I received an invitation the last week, and the lady told me, well, you haven't started. Saturday morning, I was in one place, I just sent her an abstract for my presentation. I, I'm sending you another one in the, in the afternoon. And when I came back in the afternoon, I said, no, no, the first one who was about that boring thing of crop physiology is the one she liked. And the second one was about the exciting subject of anthropology and related to the, this. She sent me, no? So, because of that, you are having me talking about this now. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going back. Uh, you remember Nikolai Babilov, the Russian guy who went all around the world collecting and established the notion of centers of origin. Yeah, and uh, people in the Andes, me in, and another also, uh, we have an idea about what is a center of origin. And my hypothesis that Nikolai Babilo was wrong about the role of the Titicaca basin in quinoa and other plants from the Andes domestication. And uh, I will go to images and I will show you some images because we understand, it depends, if you are analytical, you can understand the world in mathematical terms, but many people understand the world in terms of images. So maybe you remember the notion of the Kekule dream. Kekule was the scientist who discovered the molecular structure of benzene. Discover is a way of saying. Uh, Kekule had a dream in which there were a group of monkeys catching each other from the tail to the head to the tail. And they said, OK, so this is the structure of benzene. Uh, if you are an epistemologist, you will say, oh, maybe. This is not benzene. This is the model we have of benzene. So perhaps benzene is not exactly the monkey's dream. Uh, these are the data. So these are contributions of Lake Titicaca. You have several species. This is a tropiolus called Nashua. 
This oxalis or oca, this is quinoa, this is the lupin uh, from there, tar scarlet tarwi. You have potatoes, you have caniwa, you have about several of these species. This is information. This is what Babilo saw. And there's no question. Babilo saw this because we see this today. The point is that what did Babilo see? And for me, the dream of Babilo was that the center of oil is kind of cornucopia, the horn of abundance, a place from where diversity arises like a kind of source. But that's one mental model. You have other ones. Uh, I like cream, so I chose, you know, this Google image is wonderful. You have an idea, you go to Google and you, go, you get anything you want. So, uh, this is creams, uh, I think it's not well written, tree of life, yeah? You see, so you can think of place like Lake Titicaca as a tree of life. Uh, you can think of Lake Titicaca also as a kind of tornado, yeah? I don't know, I remember when was this one, but I have been, I have been, six or seven times here the last year, and I went into two tornadoes. So I know how frequent tornadoes are here. Uh, well, another way of thinking is, maybe some of you know this place, uh, that maybe we can think, uh, this is the fascination of Google, uh, about like Titicaca in other ways. For example, a roundabout. What is a roundabout? And that is what I'm going to tell is a place where we meet. So, and uh, there's an author, Arnold Toynbee. He was, as the story says, the last historian who tried to understand history, not history. So, uh, one day we'll read the book. Now we just know the images. Uh, he spoke of uh, civilization roundabouts. And this is an example of Samarkand. Uh, where is here? Here is Samarkand. Uh, I don't know in which country, so it's Samarkand is in one of the Eastans. Uh, Uzbekistan, I don't know. Please correct me if you're from the other. And you know, the Silk Road went through Samarkand. So Samarkand was a place where civilizations met. Uh, you have another example. You have Aleppo in Syria. Where is Aleppo? It's somewhere around. Right? With my glasses. Uh, here is Aleppo. Aleppo was another roundabout. People from Egypt people from Mesopotamia, people from Greece, people from many places came to Aleppo to meet and exchange. Uh, let's go back to Lake Titicaca. Lake Titicaca is in the border between Bolivia and Peru. So now there's a border. 500 years, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, there was no border. And the border, all the border was not this. We have several revelers, Osa, you know, Osa is Spanish, sorry. Uh, uh, Lake Titicaca is a place where conditions for agriculture are very good. Uh, there's where you find many of the species we are speaking about. We have the Titicaca Basin going from Cusco up to uh, Oruro in the south, Oruro's around here. And you have some relevant uh, points here. For example, Tiwanaku. That is where the center, the ceremonial center of Tiwanaku culture was. Tiwanaku people feed themselves on two crops, quinoa and potatoes. There were one million people 1,000 years ago in this area. You also have Isla del Sol. What is Isla del Sol? Well, you have Tiwanaku here, and you also have Isla del Sol. Why is Isla del Sol so relevant? Because of this. You remember the Incas were a group of guys who came out from a cave. There were four brothers, two men, two women. And they had the tradition that they kept of marrying between brothers, like the Egyptians. Uh, what the Incas say is that the ancestors, and they call ancestors the Ajar, and that is very relevant for quinoa, because the wild quinoa is called Ajara or Ajar. These ancestors, uh, they say that uh, they originated in this island, and they came out in a place called Pacaritambo, near Cusco. So what they did is to move halves. They move halves. And when it was coming, and I asked the lady, I didn't took this without permission, in the company to let me bring you this. You know what halves are. Is where, again, people meet. 
Yeah? So, there was a hub. The Incas were very clever because the hub before was the Tiwanaku culture. And after that, the hub was the Incas civilization. And uh, well, you have here the, the Inca, the both Incas in front of the mountain. And okay. Uh, this is Templo del Sol in the Titicaca in the Isla del Sol, because the original name of Isla del Sol is Titicaca. Titicaca. And well, so this is an idea of how this works. So we have Lake Titicaca, this is a center of plant diversity, but it's a center of civilization, and it's a strong meeting place. Uh, then you have the Salaris de Juni, where most quinoa is grown now. You have a place here called Chaliapata, where quinoa, where the of quinoa, where the quinoa price is established. And here's Argentina. I understand that in some way, quinoa is also have Argentina, Northwest, and we, you have other halves. So this is a book, a fascinating book, relating all the plants that were domesticated or cultivated by traditional people. The Mapuche, or perhaps people before the Mapuche in Chile. So I became strongly interested in what we call cambalaches. What is a cambalache? Is this? It's a barter fair. It's a meeting place. People meet in fairs to exchange products. So uh, cambalache is a farmer's market in at least Argentina and Chile. And uh, they also, but they also, they don't meet any day. They meet for religious ceremony. So it's an exchange play. So you have here the idea of hubs. You have bigger hubs, smaller hubs. Uh, for example, you have this is an individual or a family. They go to a, a, a place, they exchange products, uh, etc. Et so you have very, very some synonymous here. You have nodes from a mathematical point of view. You have fairs, you have festivities. And here you have some of the exchange that can arise from Argentina, for example. Uh, some people exchange products with Chile. Some people go to Bolivia to Isla del Sol, and some people go to Peru. For example, in June, at the start of the new year, there's the interrail ceremony. This is when the sun starts to get bigger. Everything is connected. Everything. So there's no independence in the Andes between data and meaning. Uh, okay, so one month ago, I went to Ecuador, and I arrived two days. So, this is San Francisco, one of the most oldest, and the door of the church, you have this. This is the representation of Inti, the sun god. You remember, Isla del Sol, island of the sun, the center. This is, you have a cycle here, and you have a space divided into four. In other words, for people who know Quichua, this is a representation of space, of the space we see, that is the Tawantin Sujo, the four corners of the world, that is the administrative organization of the Inca Empire, but this is also a representation of another kind of a place. Get a look at this because we are going into a church. This is the roof. Uh, maybe you are familiar with the notion of fractals. You have one here, and you open, and you have a replication here, and you open, and this make you feel mad. You have a network here. You have the bar first. You have the market in the roof of the church. This was done a few decades after the conquest a few decades after the conquest. Look, this is Argentina. This is the transition area between the Chaco, so the dry forest here. You have the highlands here. You have a very rugged environment here. And you have the rainforest here. So you have a, a, a huge variation, environmental variation from this place to this place. And these are locations where we got quinoa. This is uh, the border between Bolivia uh, and Argentina. This is Iruja, this is 60 kilometers. 
60 kilometers. This is one of the places most interesting, not only from the biodiversity point of view, with the work here, fascinating with ethnobotanists, but also uh, much more things. People go walking from this place, and this is 60 kilometers territory. So these are some of the possible exchange roads in this area. You have this one, you have this one, this one. And why do we speak of corridors? Because the corridor is a narrow piece of land you go. And we, when we see the distribution of the genetic groups, we see that some genetic groups do this movement, I do this movement, and you're going to have 10 kilometers from one place in the mountains to other place in the valleys. And there's a very long genetic distance between these materials and these materials. That's a fascinating thing. So let's go back to nostalgia, nostalgia. I prefer to say in Spanish, you know, we are the people of tango. We are the people of nostalgia. Why? Because we came from Italy and we miss Italy. We miss our mother. All the songs are about nostalgia, missing, missing, missing. Uh, so, uh, for those who know this movie, you know this song. And uh, you know this is scene too. And maybe not all of you, but many of you those has this notion, the notion of the will of life, the will of fate. Then, let's go back to another question. We are biologists, molecular biologists, etc. The point is that there are other disciplines in science too. There's a people who are called archaeologists. And sometimes what archaeologists think goes exactly in the opposite direction of what we biologists think. For example, you have the Aymara people. Now, where are the boys from Bolivia? Well, I can say. Uh, the Aymara people. Uh, now are in the highlands from a part of Chile, Argentina, and, and these are different kingdoms. And uh, we think that quinoa originated here, and from here spread to here, 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 here. But the archaeologists, the most important archaeologists, see, see, say that the Aymaras originated the quinoa here. I'm sorry, say Aymara, say quinoa, I don't know why. Uh, I went up this way. Yeah, so maybe we should talk a little bit more with archaeologists. Uh, so that's one point. Then this is a kind of representation I did of Lake Titicaca as a kind of wheel and the genetic groups we have. And we have one of the groups in one of the valleys coming from Bolivia going this way and then going this way up to Argentina. You have another group who is from the dry highlands? This one, we have another group who is from the dry valleys. It's big here, here. And we have another group the, from the coastal lake Titicaca and northwest Argentina that are connected not by biology, but by people movement. Because all this is not about verbs, it's about people movement. So, uh, so I, is, is, I, I'm sorry, is that more right? The wind, 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 the one you used to take water from the side. Okay. Uh, then let's go to the notion of meeting places. And so what, going back to the Andean view, we go from data to meaning, but we don't have to forget we started from data. But what is a meeting place? Meeting place is a common ground. Here we were, no, we are, we were a meeting place. Uh, so a meeting place is a common ground. Uh, for me, the language is, is the common ground of humanity. How can we communicate with each other uh, without languages? Because if we don't have language, we are only data. But when you have language, we are data, but we are also meaning. I just invented this. Uh, so uh, fairs, parties, religious ceremony are places between commas where we meet. The point is, what do we trade and meet? And my hypothesis is that we tread sadness and joy. In Spanish, tristeza y alegría. Why? Uh, in this book about traditional tales, this book has some tales that are older than civilization. Very, very old tales. It's not written. It doesn't say here, this tale is older than civilization. This is, these are fables. But these are not fables. So again, fables, 
data and meaning. And then, uh, in the Andes, at least, sadness is located at the start of agriculture. We are not farmers because we wanted to be. We are farmers because the hunter-gatherer's way of living didn't work. Some people, how did this lady who speaks about the density of effect? Uh, you, you know, the, the, the one who questioned Malthus, and she said that uh, agriculture and technological innovation arise from human population and not the opposite way. Ah, I will remember later. Uh, I thought you, you, you know that. Uh, so, uh, in the Andes, uh, this fall text speak of a huge environmental crisis, a huge environmental crisis. There's a beautiful landscape in which there's a god who's called Tulupa, who starts in Lake Titicaca, a place with a lot of water. And he's a male god. And he's punished by Viracocha. And he's condemned to, uh, he's put in a, in a boat, and the boat goes up to a place called Pampa Auliagas. So the people from Pampa Auliagas, they know what I'm talking about. And uh, so, and people say that Pampa Auliagas is where Atlantida was, water, water, water. There, Tunupa disappears. And the people from around the salt flat, so uh, dualism in the Andes means two opposites that are connected. It's a kind of yin, uh, yin and yang. So you have Lady Dikaka, a lot of water. You have the salt flats, no water. You have a god, it's a male, linked to Lady Dikaka. And you have a goddess, who's a female, linked to the salt flats. And that is Tunupa or Tunapa. And there's a legend related to Tunupa in which there's a lady who escaped from his husband in a place called Kondo. How many kilometers from Kondo to Pampolliagas? Quantos kilometers de Kondo to Pampolliagas? Quanto hay? In kilometers. A quanto estás? Nada. Nada. Bien. Uh, so you have a god, a female god linked to water that disappears. You have a, a male god. I have a female god that appears in the town as she escaped from her husband. She walks with his baby, with her baby, across the pampas. And when she walks, she has a chuspa. And in her chuspa, she had quinoa. And the chuspa gets broken. And the seeds are, go to the floor, to the soil. Not by chance. That's the main production area for quinoa today. And Tunupa ends in a place where she becomes a volcano. And that volcano is named Tunupa. And is the most important geographical trace in the Salar du Jun. OK, let's go back. So then, uh, I say that sadness is a start of agriculture. If you have any doubt, remember paradise. Yeah? So, but agriculture is joy too. And we need to share the joy. Since the beginning of history, we had the harvest ceremony. And we share materially, because we share, we share emotion, you say spirituality. So we share the joy in many ways. Well, this tale is in Spanish. It's very short, it's very nice. It's about the transition from the hunter-gatherer life to the agricultural life. So the hunter-gatherer life is represented by the father. And the agricultural life is represented by the mother. I'm not translating this into English. Any one of you who wants English translation, do it yourself. It's much more relevant to do it yourself than to her to do it now. I will read it in Spanish. Please allow this to stay in Spanish. You know, it was in Quechua, went to Spanish, it does not. It's called Los Gorriones. Gorriones, well, un muchacho travieso trepó un aliso y cogió un nido de gorriones. La madre de los pájaros que lo ve da voces al macho avisándole. Oye, mira a nuestros hijos aún desnuditos. Se los lleva ocultándolos bajo el poncho. Ay, hijo, hijo mío, ¿qué importa? 
deja que se lo lleve. Todavía hay semilla. Ah, qué pena, no digas eso, porque darlos a luz cuesta trabajo y dolor. People from the Andes know that and Mario Tapia, the person who knows a lot of, about quinoa, said that in the Quinoa Congress in Ecuador. He said, people don't grow quinoa. They tend quinoa. They raise quinoa because quinoa are their family, their son, their daughters. That's the way farmers think about quinoa. And uh, maybe you know Carmina Burana. Carmina Burana is a group of songs that were found in Germany and they come from the Middle Ages, a, a part of our history in which we did not have the illusion of control over nature. And that is what Carmina Burana is about. It's very nice in Latin, but here you have the English translation, thanks to Google. So, uh, and it speaks about the will of life, the will of life. And so I said, it's, you know, when you go to a casino, yeah, you bet. You can lose, you can win. You can lose all, you can win a lot. That's the idea of the will of fortune. Uh, now come the not nice part of the question. Uh, I have a strong feeling, and sorry to say this here because I know there's a lot of people that think that climate change doesn't exist, or if it does exist, it has nothing to do with human activity. Uh, I think that we are entering again an age of sadness. The point is, where will we look for joy when that has sad, when that kindness, when that sadness comes? So, as a civilization, we are facing an age of sadness, and this, if you want to. Uh, have a whole night without sleeping, just read this article. I had it here. So it's just public published. It's about the evidence of carbon impact on climate change. It's amazing, amazing how much evidence it is. And then what should we do? And then I go back to this article by Barbara Gerrit. Please pay attention to how people face facts. Another question is, uh, there's an anthropologist, she's called Olivia Jess. She's uh, from Belgium. She married a guy in uh, Argentina. She lived for several years near the border between um, Argentina and Bolivia. And she wrote this article. This article is part of her thesis. And it's called, I'm sorry for my friends, Instrumentalise la Nostalgie. And she said that people gather in these photo trots not only to exchange products, they exchange nostalgia. They speak about a past that is lost. This is in part the meaning of this fair. And uh, I found this in, the, in Quito, and this is fascinating. There's a door, and that door was made hundreds of years ago, shortly after the conquest. And the door has two sides, two sides, one to the left, one to the right. The right is a representation of the church, Christianity, the Europeans, the Spaniards. Uh, I took a photo, I said, what can this be? But I, I did draw and took a photo, and one hour later, I met a chaman. I had a very long conversation with the chaman. I asked him, what is this for you? Obvious, he said to me, this is a kipu. The not system, people in the Andes, used to take account of information we still cannot translate. So it is a writing we cannot translate. So what does he say that? The artist and the card the door represent his vision of the conquest as the two parts of the door. So for me, this means that people accommodated to the conquest in this way. Okay, there's a door. You have one side of the door, you have the other side. Both sides of the door have a function because the door has a function. But you have one side to the left, to the west, to the keep. This is the Andes. You have another side to the right, to the east. This is the cross. I think this is a strong message for us about how to deal with difference. We are here, you are there. We are similar, we are both part of the door, but we are different. We are the Kipu, the Andes, you are the cross. Okay. 